I would begin with a, a brief presentation of Jamie Galbraith, who definitely does not need to be presented, but I will take a couple of minutes anyway um, to uh, do so. So James Galbraith holds the Lloyd Benston Junior Chair in Government and Business Relations at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs and a professorship in government at the University of Texas at Austin. So Jamie has a PhD in economics from Yale, but also two honorary PhDs, one from Plekhanov Russian University of Economics uh, of 2017, and one from the Université Pierre Monde France of October 2010. Of course, um, his CV is impressive with the amount of the long list of awards he's um, been, been granted with, but he has, uh, just to mention a few, one from 2022 was the Beblem Commons Award and the prestigious Leontiv Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economics in 2014. I'm also proud to say that he's a member of the Academia Nazionale di Lincei, which is one of the most, the most prestigious academic institution um, in Italy. And that's where actually we met at uh, a dinner after his a conference where uh, Jamie was one of the speakers. And um, of course, what's wonderful about his career is his um, policy roles. So his active um, involvement as a, a public intellectual. And he's actually, just to cite a few that are quite fascinating, he was executive director of the Joint Economic Committee of the United States Congress in the early 1980s. And from 1993 to 1997, Galbraith served as chief technical advisor for macroeconomic reform to the State Planning Commission of the People's Republic of China. I also would like to end with the mentioning the three latest books of Professor Galbraith. We have Welcome to the Poison Challenge, The Destruction of Greece and the Future so of Europe. Taken, but I'm gonna get on this. On this um... We have Inequality, What Everyone Needs to Know of 2016 and The End of Normal, The Great Crisis and the Future of Growth of 2014. I would also like to mention that uh, James just wrote a very a brilliant article on The Nation on February 18th uh, called How the Left Should Think About Inflation. And so he's, uh, he's, um, he's very prolific nowadays in uh, constantly writing op-eds in numerous uh, newspapers and magazines. So his voice is heard with pleasure uh, from us always. And the floor is yours, J uh, Jamie, for your presentation. And then we have Andreas uh, discuss a bit. Thank you. Clara, thank you very, very much. And uh, let me just say to begin with that it's a tremendous pleasure uh, for me to be uh, joining you today and to see uh, so many of my friends uh, here. Uh, I, uh, I'll share my screen intermittently. Uh, but, uh, just to start with, I'll talk just a bit about my 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 title, which is uh, drawn from a a, a t-shirt actually uh, that I understand was circulating amongst the uh, graduate students in economics at the University of Cambridge in the uh, mid 1980s, which was about a decade after I spent a year there in 1974 1975, uh, and. Uh, in the wake of the of the of the passing of the of the last members of of uh, Keynes's circus, uh, notably uh, two people who I got to know rather well, especially um, uh, John uh, Nicholas Caldor and uh, to a lesser degree John Robinson, uh, and uh, also uh, the very notable. Uh, an important figure in 20th century economics, Piero Sraffa, who in my year there was very much uh, uh, sadly in, in, in decline, but uh, uh, whose influence was, uh, was, was simply uh, enormous. Um, and these were three people who's, who's, uh, uh, had very distinct and potent presence uh, in the department at Cambridge at that time. With their passing, uh, the tradition 
of the Cambridge Keynesians did not die out. Uh, it was carried on by quite a number of people, among, among others, uh, Richard Goodwin, whose lectures I had the privilege of attending in the year I was there, uh, by Ajit Singh for a, a, a long, long time, uh, in spite of uh, uh, considerable physical challenges, uh, and in certain particular areas uh, by, uh, by Robin Maris and by a, a gentleman who was my tutor uh, in 1974, uh, went on to the uh, career at the World Bank and ultimately uh, at uh, in Sussex, uh, Adrian Wood. Um, also, I will mention other people as 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 as, as I go forward. Uh, and it was carried on in uh, uh, the uh, um, on on in this continent, as everybody knows, by the post Keynesian tradition, which was championed by by Paul Davidson, and paralleled uh, by uh, the work of Hyman Minsky. Uh, and giving rise ultimately to the emergent uh, tradition of modern monetary theory, uh, and also uh, by an Anglo-Italian branch uh, led, uh, I would say substantially by Luigi Pesanetti and including very importantly, Mario Nuti, Pierangelo Garigliani and uh, Alessandro Roncaglia. Uh, but the tradition lost uh, prominence and became a marginal factor in the politics of academic economics and in policy debates. And in, in this country, it was squeezed heavily uh, between obviously the overwhelmingly predominant neoclassical mainstream uh, and a small uh, uh, surviving radical and Marxian uh, tradition, uh, which maintained it uh, to the extent that economists needed to have a second voice or a dissenting view. Uh, that was the one that was continued to survive to a large extent uh, on, in, in North America. Uh, having been exposed to it when I was, uh, however, actually dilettantishly on the course of a one year uh, uh, transit as a, under something called Regulation 9 for Research Students, which enabled me to take the undergraduate tripos while posing as a PhD student. Uh, and with a deeply insufficient background as I had been an undergraduate degree, had an undergraduate degree in social studies and uh, uh, only had taken applied and empirical economics classes at Harvard. But I still knew that if I lived for a long enough time, I might be one of the last uh, surviving relics of a particular historical and intellectual period. Um, and uh, th that I could therefore speak uh, of Cambridge economics as, a, as an eyewitness with only limited challenges to my authority. This is perhaps a somewhat unfortunate place to do that because there are a number of people here who are uh, still senior to me, but uh, I have to to, uh, grasp my opportunities while I have them, recognizing that you know I may also pass out of the scene before uh, before the last one of my contemporaries does. In any event, the moment has come close enough. So I was I was moved to make a topic uh, out of this for my talk today, um, and it was mainly by the response, uh, which was rather vivid, um, and um, in some cases, rather strongly supportive and affectionate, uh, and in a few others, uh, sharply uh, and deeply annoyed, uh, to a book review, which I published uh, on January 14th in Project Syndicate. Uh, the book, uh, primarily of a book that just appeared called Cogs and Monsters, What Economics Is and What It Should Be, uh, by Diane Coyle. Uh, a professor of public policy at Cambridge uh, who was minted in economics at, at Harvard in the early 1980s and is thus a, a, a product of the, of the Thatcher-Reagan generation and of the new classical counter-revolution in important respects. Uh, and uh, this was a period, of course, when micro foundations and rational expectations uh, were, or I, perhaps I should say, had become the litmus test of seriousness in economics. Uh, now, uh, Coyle is a, is a sensible person. Uh, I don't want to disparage her, and she is not unaware of the slide uh, into embarrassment and irrelevance uh, that in, uh, in the eyes of, of any sentient observer in Britain from the queen herself on down, uh, that has overtaken uh, mainstream economics 
especially since the financial crisis of 2007-2009, which, as uh, Paul Krugman recently wrote, nobody saw coming except for those who did, uh, whose views are unimportant uh, quad erat demonstrandum because they are not mainstream economists and therefore not blind uh, to the recurring phenomenon of uh, phenomena of financial crisis, debt deflation, and industrial collapse. And I have to go back to my screen, uh, the particular case here uh, of uh, another Cambridge figure whom I met briefly in this period, Wynne Godley, uh, who uh, I got to know much better uh, later on. Wynne, who uh, uh, was came to Cambridge from uh, uh, from the UK Treasury, was at the Department of Applied Economics and developed a uh, uh, stock flow consistent three sector models, and who was specifically noted on the headline I put up below his photograph. And the photograph is also from the same source the, uh, as the economist who modeled the crisis in the New York Times of, uh, of the 10th of September 2013. The New York Times is a paper in which I understand Professor Krugman actually publishes these days and has been for some time. Uh, but uh, you know, I suppose one can be somewhat generous for not being aware of everything that's in the archives there. Um, in any event, uh, attempts to advance a, uh, what, what Professor Coyle does is attempt to advance a reconstruction of mainstream economics rooted in the work of applied microeconomists on such topics as, uh, uh, as uh, non-optimizing behavior, product differentiation, uh, and increasing returns. These were of course completely familiar uh, to me from my my year at Cambridge, almost a half century earlier. Uh, so I paired my review of Coyle with one of a small book that I happen to have on hand. So I used to call Economics Without Equilibrium by Nicholas Keldor. It was a, uh, based upon a set of lectures. The, uh, um, the Arthur M. Oaken Memorial Lectures at Yale in the uh, early 1980s, there's a photograph of the author on the back, uh, and published in, in, in 1985. The comparison is unfavorable uh, to Professor Coyle for a couple of reasons. Uh, the lesser one is simply a lack of scholarly awareness of critical precedents, uh, a common enough uh, flaw amongst modern economists who have been trained to ignore the history of their field uh, and rarely read uh, in, the hist- in, in that uh, area. Uh, but uh, I wanna leave that aside for the time being. The, the greater flaw is that uh, Professor Coyle's approach, which is like that of the modern mainstream generally, consists in, for, in taking first one and then another variation uh, in or deviation from the new classical ideal state of the 1980s era discipline and grafting uh, it on to the theoretical underlying theoretical skeleton as if perhaps one could strap antlers on a horse and, and thereby uh, make it into a moose. Uh, this habit is again, not it's not unique to Professor Coyle. It's in a long tradition that includes uh, to mention an economist that I greatly respect, uh, Joe Stiglitz, it includes asymmetric information. It goes back to the early efforts uh, to reduce Keynes to the ISLM general equilibrium framework, or even more simply, and even somewhat earlier, uh, to uh, the avatar of a model in which uh, sticky wages are the essential departure from the neoclassical uh, position. And this was not what the Cambridge project, uh, what the Keynesian revolution uh, uh, conceived in its broadest terms was about. So that sort of raises the question, what was it about? Uh, and that's a daunting question. Uh, it would take, I think, many hours to answer in full, something I, I rather doubt that I could do adequately, but I will uh, try to give a radically compressed uh, version. 
I would say, just speaking in historical context, that the Keynesian revolution was about the collapse of Victorian virtues and Victorian verities, such as the importance of hard work, of thrift, and of saving. Uh, and this collapse, which began in the ferment of the Edwardian uh, philosophical upheaval, in which Keynes himself was reared, it, uh, carried on uh, to the collapse of the Victorian habits of capital accumulation uh, in the cauldron of the First World War and the subsequent Great uh, Depression, which also destroyed Alfred Marshall's modernization of economics as a matter of supply and demand uh, balanced together in markets. Uh, a proposition that Marshall's uh, theory should be discarded altogether was offered uh, by Piero Sraffa in a famous uh, remark uh, very early uh, uh, in, this, uh, in, in, in the course of these developments. So that's the first thing that there, there, was, there was really an upheaval about the whole way one thinks about the world and thinks about the proper way to approach uh, economic policy and social conduct. And second, the perspective that Keynes brought uh, to bear was that of an investor uh, and speculator rooted in the present, conscious of the past, facing a necessarily uncertain future and using access to credit and the money creating capacity of the banks uh, to place bets with real resources, uh, essentially the essence of the actual existing capitalist system, bets whose outcomes would depend critically not only on objective conditions, but also on whether others with similar resources uh, at their command acted along the same or potentially different lines. In other words, uh, it was intrinsically a view of the system as evolutionary, as unstable, as non-equilibrium, as a system of monetary production. And so I'll come to just to quickly to, to Keynes here. Um, here he is as a young man in the famous painting. Uh, and then uh, the photograph is a mature uh, uh, person and major public figure. Uh, Keynes, for Keynes, sorry, uh, the, uh, uh, the construct of monetary production has a particular significance, uh, which I will bring to your attention this, right at this point. In writing about it, which he did initially in lectures in 1933, Keynes makes direct reference uh, to Einstein, uh, both in, and it continues that reference both in the title of the general theory, it's why he calls the book the general theory, uh, and in the structure of the book, well, with the allusion made explicit by a passage in chapter two. Uh, that quote, the classical economists are like Euclidean geometers in a non-Euclidean world. Uh, and it goes on, uh, I don't have it in front of me uh, to say that whose only uh, uh, recourse upon seeing that lines apparently parallel collide in practice is to rebuke them for the unfortunate collisions which are occurring. Monetary production in short is based on. It is the merging of two concepts which were distinct in the classical vision, namely the commodity space and the monetary veil uh, into a single unified uh, economic analysis. And I, I have to say, uh, I can't resist showing you the David Lowe uh, cartoon without pointing out that I happen to own the original of it or at least one copy of the original. In the tradition of if you've got it, flaunt it. Um, a construct of monetary production integrates um, the uh, in, in, integrates the financial and the non-financial sectors exactly as Einstein integrated space and time. And the concept of the macroeconomy is not some detached entity of aggregates that can be theorized about on its own, but an organic structure that gives direction to nations, to sectors, to companies, to households, to workers, to anybody you can, who participates in the economy as a whole. Micro foundations, therefore, the basis of the new classical uh, counter-revolution is not only a nonsense, but a superfluity. Uh, in the, and in the words of John Archibald Wheeler, again, I think somewhat approximate, and this is right, space tells matter where to go, matter tells space how to curve. 
uh, all of these things are tied up in a, in a philosophical and scientific revolution, uh, which Keynes was fully aware of, but which never quite made it in uh, to the consciousness of the, uh, of the mainstream of the economics profession. Within the ambit of an evolutionary macroeconomics, the function of markets uh, for produced commodities is not to equilibrate supply demand by adjusting prices. It's a magical mechanism to which Professor Coyle makes reference and I quote her in my review, uh, but to coordinate orders and production volumes at prices that are determined largely by costs and which are in turn an amalgam of fixed and variable costs whose relationship is governed by technological possibility, external conditions, profit expectations and interest rates. The normal condition of production uh, is declining costs, uh, increasing returns over time, uh, and cumul cumulative causation and cumulative advantage. Profit maximization as a motive is undefined and dependent of the time frame. You have to specify whether you're talking about short term or long term. So something in between before the concept begins to make sense at all. The capital stock, uh, as John Robinson. Uh, obviously worked to stress is a heterogeneous collection of fixed assets which cannot be reduced to a common measure uh, of value without first stipulating an interest rate. And thus one cannot differentiate a production function to obtain marginal factor productivities and profits or wages. Distribution is therefore an institutional and political process where institutional size, span of control, access to instruments of economic power are decisive, uh, and the direction of the evolution of, of, of distribution, as I shall argue presently, is in, bound up with the, uh, with the movement of the macroeconomic uh, space that, in which everything is embedded. Uh, these comments I think are consistent with Keynes, with Caldor, with John Robinson. It's a capital critique uh, with Shroffa. And with my father's uh, depiction of the industrial state as an entity dominated by organizations, not markets, uh, and if governed properly, governed by countervailing power. And I have one more um, Keynes uh, um, caricature to share with you. This one I have downstairs in my uh, in the room downstairs. But, uh, come on. Oop. I don't know, so it's a contribution by the New Yorker cartoonist Edward Sorrell depicting a, an encounter that occurred in 1942 at the Office of Price Administration in Washington, D.C., when a gentleman who was identified to my father as Keynes uh, appeared uh, after lunch, waiting to see him with a paper on the pricing of, of pigs and maize or corn and hogs. And you can see that uh, they were admiring of the photograph of, of, of one of Keynes' pigs, he was raising them and tilting. I don't think the photograph was there in real life, but everything else has a certain verisimilitude. Uh, in any event, uh, can't resist. Um, the Cambridge economics uh, of that era saw all of these items as elements of a single integrated economic discipline obviating the need for neoclassical microeconomics or for the neoclassical synthesis, which was promulgated in the 1940s and 1950s, mainly at MIT, mainly by the American economists who adopted elements of Keynes's policy vision while basically eviscerating uh, the larger context of his uh, and his colleagues theoretical construct. What's missing from the Cambridge tradition? I think that Cambridge economics of that era uh, lacked, and I can make an exception for, for, for Salter's uh, uh, tech, uh, productivity and technical change, but it by and large lacked an analysis of, of, of technological changes, uh, which was to some degree supplied uh, by my father insofar as technology is the foundation of organizational structure, but and also in greater part by uh, the ideologically very hostile Joseph Schumpeter whose insights into the destructive character of 
technological revolutions and his brutalist acceptance of those uh, devil take the hindmost down sort of approach to the justification of capitalism made him, I think, rather immiscible to the uh, Cambridge, uh, to the Cambridge thinking. Nevertheless, integrating Schumpeter's view uh, is an important element uh, in, uh, in sort of bringing uh, the large, this larger body of thinking uh, into, uh, uh, into a coherent uh, single picture. Uh, and Schumpeter was a very important critic of the neoclassical constructs, uh, as, as were the Cambridge thinkers. So Schumpeter's vision of technological upheavals associated radical uh, revaluations of capital assets uh, has an important bearing on the second major lacuna, which relates uh, to in income distribution. The Cambridge Keynesians, who wrote, after all, in a period where uh, data analysis was still in a relatively uh, uh, primitive the state uh, tended to think in terms of class categories, that is, say, func so-called functional distribution, and not so much in terms of quantitative dispersions, about which there was, in any event, uh, rather little to go on. And beginning with with Kuznets, there was more of a discussion of this, but it was not something that was a terribly well formed by the, by the 1970s in Cambridge. And so I'll come here to I'll say a few words about. Uh, the things that I've been working on, which have you know, spend your life sort of trying to develop a tradition and pull things together. Uh, this is the kind of thing you've come to. And I would I would rate the things that I do as uh, having had basically two major elements. The first was to try to supply the evidence required uh, for, to underpin a theory of income distribution uh, that I did not believe when I was doing this would be proved to be consistent with the Cambridge vision that I was exposed to in my 20s, but which seems to me to have, seems to me to have happened. And uh, therefore I'm quite pleased that that, that was not, a, that it has, has some broader implications than simply an exercise uh, in empirical investigation. Now the evidence I think is strong enough to validate both the Keynes slash Galbraith and the Schumpeter um, views. Wages are determined largely uh, by organizational scale, bureaucratic precedence, market power, the overall conditions of demand affecting those who are weak and vulnerable much more uh, seriously and, uh, than those who are in a stronger position and a relatively stable one. The larger income distribution is measured in tax or survey data, let's say incorporating also income from capital is governed by capital asset valuations. Uh, and these result largely substantially from Schumpeterian processes, very unstable uh, processes of boom and bust. These two dominant forces are sometimes at odds. That is, uh, they push the distribution in opposite directions. You can often have a situation in the course of a credit boom in which the uh, wage distribution is becoming more compressed due to strong demand con conditions that boost the wages at the bottom of the structure relative to those in the middle and upper middle, while at the same time, capital asset valuations are increasing inequality by stretching out the distribution at the top. And we've seen this in numerous times. Um, the data, however, underscore that distributional outcomes are artifacts of macroeconomic conditions. And this gets me back to the core point that I want to make, which is the, I think the point uh, that the, was um, essentially lost in the movement of uh, the appreciation of Keynes across the Atlantic from Britain to the United States, which is that there's only one economics. Uh, and neoclassical microeconomics, which was after all uh, invented substantially to try and explain and even to rationalize and justify uh, factor shares and the distribution of income, uh, as I say, explain those things in terms of technical productivities and so forth, marginal productivities, is almost wholly or largely or wholly irrelevant uh, to the issue that it was created to address, uh, namely the rewards to factors. Uh, so one can simply, uh, by and large, set it aside and treat the whole economy, including distributional uh, considerations, as the interaction of macroeconomic forces and institutional structures. And this is the, this is the, the, the uh, I think the first uh, of this, of the two uh, points that I would, I would just like to have made during the course of this talk. 
Uh, the second one uh, has been to try to bring uh, Keynesian, Cambridge Keynesian constructs to bear on the international setting, that is to say the setting of a globalized economy uh, characterized uh, by an international division of labor. In this effort, I, I'm, I'm very much in the spirit of a, yet another figure whom I only mentioned uh, very briefly, uh, but who I, uh, whom I hold the highest, uh, just absolutely the highest respect and regard, uh, and that's, um, that's Luigi Passanetti. Uh, uh, in my view, the most important living economic theorist uh, and the central figure uh, in the uh, carrying on the Cambridge Keynesian uh, theoretical tradition. Among the key tenets, and there are a collection of his books, uh, of, the, of Pazanetti's theoretical worldview are that prices are determined uh, by costs, uh, that best practice technology is essentially similar wherever it is put down and is put down where it is possible to put it down. There are obviously limits to that. Uh, and uh, the, uh, in actual practice, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the scale or the, the technol of technology in effect depends upon the vintage of what's operating uh, at what time it was created. The country's progress by learning and not by uh, learning occurs in part through uh, international exchange, but they don't import other countries' productivity gains, and that the wage scale in a country is applied to the whole technological uh, technical package. In other words, there is no significant substitution of capital and labor based upon differences in wages. Pazanetti uh, is, of course, consistent, and his work builds on and completes that of Sraffa, Vasily Leontiev, and, and Salter. Uh, but I would uh, I very much stress uh, the importance of his role. And what we can add to this, uh, practically speaking, oh, I should mention, as I say in the bottom of the slide, that uh, he's not finished, that there is a book called The Theory of Value, uh, which according to the Rutledge website, uh, as of this morning, is uh, due, to have, uh, due to make an appearance quite soon. Let's hope that that's the case. Um, the, uh, yeah, come back here. Um, what I can add to this, or what I've tried to add to this, practically speaking, are a couple of propositions. First, that globalization has fostered or perhaps reproduced what was already present in colonial times, an international and hierarchical division of labor uh, between economies dominated by resources, extraction, agriculture, between manufacturing powers uh, supplying mainly consumer goods uh, and advanced technological and financial powers of which the US, UK, and Japan um, most recently are the, are, the, are the leading examples. So that there is, one, has to, one cannot consider the world economy as a set of countries that can be modeled according to the same equations. One has to ask what kind of economies do they actually have and how do they, how do they fit uh, in, in, in an entire global system. And secondly, that the country's position in this structure determines the relationship between growth or crisis, recession, depression, and inequality in its internal distribution, a pro proposition that can be documented in data only after extensive empirical work, uh, that is to say, once consistent and dense measurements of inequality come to, uh, into existence. And this gets me to... Uh, Next slide here, which is uh, which is a, a, just a, a purely schematic uh, representation of the argument I want to make, uh, based upon uh, it was published initially uh, back in the 1990s, and then in a book published in 2012. This called the this was work done with Pedro Concesiao, who is now uh, head of the. Human Development Report Office at the United Nations. Uh, we call a stylized or augmented Kuznets curve. Uh, you can see the first part of it on the, on the left side is the traditional inverted U hypothesized by Kuznets, in which as income uh, increases uh, with the in the course of industrialization and urbanization, inequality has a tendency to increase, uh, while uh, as countries become more industrialized, they move to uh, the other side of the inverted U. 
uh, and as income further increases, there's a tendency for inequality to come back down. Uh, what we hypothesize is that in a globally integrated economy, the curve has a tendency to turn back up at the high end. And that is because the countries that are supplying the advanced capital codes and financial services, such services, and it's a nice gentle word for it, uh, to uh, the, the world, when they grow more rapidly, it is the highest end uh, that benefits most, and it's capital asset valuations that benefit most. So that in a uh, in the in the particular crisis that occurred in the uh, beginning in 1980 and carrying on to 2000, the following two things happened at once. One was one was a decline uh, in the relative uh, position of the. Uh, semi-industrialized developing countries, capital, consumer goods producers, pushing up inequality there in the course of crisis. While at the same time, uh, China notably uh, was undergoing a continuing process of industrialization, which also pushed up inequality there. Uh, so you had for this 20 year period uh, in the global system, a consistent rise by and large with very few exceptions uh, in the in, in inequality, uh, com which was essentially a combination of their initial structural position uh, and what was going on in the, uh, in the global macroeconomic and financial sphere. Uh, and what we did then with, after accumulating a, a very substantial data set with some 4,000 country year observations over, over the 150 countries going back to the early 1960s and up now into the middle of the, of the last decade, uh, is develop a, um, uh, a, a body of information on the movement of inequality, in this case, a uh, core force behind uh, rising inequality within countries, which is the inequality in their industrial sectors. It's the thing that's driving the process. Uh, and extract from that uh, through a very simple technique of uh, the, the fixed effects to uh, regression model applied to the whole panel, uh, a pattern of, of movement uh, that is common to the world economy as a whole. Uh, and it involves basically, uh, in this stage in the data, three uh, major trends and transitions. One of them is uh, in the period following from the late 1960s and particularly following the, uh, uh, the collapse of Bretton Woods uh, in uh, 1971. Uh, there was, a, generally speaking, in most countries, a decline in inequality due to high commodity prices and readily accessible credit. It came to an end in 1980. And then as you move around the world and it's consistent and the data are consistent in showing what's happening in particular countries as well as the overall trend, the great debt crisis of the early uh, 1980s, uh, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and the associated Central European countries, uh, and then the Asian uh, crisis though, the things leading up to the Asian crisis in 1997 and onward. Up till about 2000, you have a dramatic increase in inequality, uh, which is, this is again, inequality within countries, but we're looking at a common trend over most of the world with only very, very limited exceptions. After 2000, it tends to level off a bit, a big spike in 2008, consistent with the great financial crisis, 2008 or 2009. But apart from that, so far, uh, and it probably has been going up again in the in the period since when, yeah, but over this period, there's at least an interruption, uh, which is associated once again with low interest rates, strong commodity prices, the Chinese market for, uh, for, for products. Uh, and uh, this period uh, is, um, as I say, a distinct, there's a distinct turning point. So you're looking once again now at macroeconomic phenomena occurring at the global scale uh, and driven substantially by uh, conditions of the financial regime applied to the underlying institutional structure of the various countries. Uh, so that's what, uh, uh, what I've been attempting to do uh, to uh, try and develop is a, a macroeconomics at the, uh, at the global scale. Uh, and there's a, there's a stack of, of, of methodological papers and get this thing to come up uh, at the University of Texas Inequality Projects website. You can uh, run through our data on, uh, on what we have uh, for various countries at various moments uh, in time. Uh, and you can run through a, uh, a research 
uh, into a whole stack of working papers, uh, now 77 of them on various topics and data sets as well that can uh, enable one to uh, basically share uh, or look into any aspect of this that might be of interest. Uh, but fundamentally, I, I regard this work as being uh, very much in the tradition, uh, oddly, uh, since I was not um, uh, intending uh, for there to be a connection necessarily. I was basically looking uh, for something that uh, graduate students without funding could, could do uh, and do effectively and uh, using a set of techniques which uh, had not been lain fallow since they were developed by Henri Tile in the 1960s. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's only really as the thing matured that we began to realize that we were in fact looking uh, at a, uh, a body of empirical work that was strongly consistent with a unified theoretical proposition uh, and tradition in which I, to which I had the fortune, good fortune of being exposed when, when I was young enough for it to make an enduring impression. I also had the good fortune of not having it beaten out of me by having to run through uh, the uh, career processes of the uh, of the mainstream of the economics profession. So I consider myself to have been very, very lucky in those, in, in those respects. Uh, it's a single indivisible subject. It's monetary production economics. It's economic space time. Uh, and seems to me, I will rest my case on, the, on both the, on the combination of the theory and the evidence. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jamie. I am open for questions. So first we have Andreas Lichtenberger. Who what, what kind of time we had? I was told 45 minutes, I was a little short, uh, but then we were a little slow getting underway. So we're in pretty good shape. But, uh, yeah, definitely. What, what do you normally run to, 1.30? Until two o'clock. Oh, then we have a lot of time. Okay, yeah. excellent. Um, I'm happy to... Uh, go into more detail as, as requested, but there are a lot of good people here who no doubt we can take a conversation any place you want to go. Exactly. So I would first give the word to Andreas Lichtenberger, who is one of our PhD students here at the New School, and uh, who will, I would say, begin the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Clara. And thanks, Jamie. This was a really interesting talk. And it was, I'm really grateful to have you here today and to have um, such an authority in the field of a critic being a critical voice in the economics discipline and also um, reminding us of the origins and the historical contextualities that um, the economics discipline has gone through and the diversity of ideas which is out there and under suppression, especially with your experience in research in terms of uh, inequality, policy governance and markets and their limitations. I think it, uh, you're really a great person to have here today for having such discussions about uh, um, the role and the development of economics and uh, which path is, this discipline can go. Um, relating a little bit to your speech that you gave about the history of the earlier Cambridge environment and what Cambridge is nowadays, also in the light of the book review from Diane Co Coyle that you gave. Um, what I thought was really interesting that um, Diane Coyle uh, puts economics as uh, she has a clear vision of economics being a policy relevant discipline, but referring to your 1996 article of economics as a real world economics, um, you also talk about economics as being a policy discipline. So I find it um, interesting to see in the light of the common ground that there's something about the common understanding of what economics can deliver and how we can understand it to make use of it but then in the different paths of how this discipline is actually figuring out itself and which, uh, which questions are asked and which paths are taken. Um, so I want to relate a little bit to this 1996 article from you because I think it brings up really interesting discussion points. Um, namely, you're saying there that economics is inherently about problems of social organization and the general good. And also, since all sciences use simplification and abstractions about reality, you're arguing that what matters for economics as a scientific approach to make simplifications that are best suited to the task. And I think the question that we're facing nowadays is how do we actually get to those appropriate simplifications 
you meant you call them appropriate generalizations, simplifications, heuristics, and principles that need to be derived from a study of the actual world. And in that sense, um, what is really important here is that you haven't been suggesting an explicit method or saying this should be a mathematical or not mathematical way, but the source of where we draw our abstractions from and which premises we're taking need to be understood from the reality that we're living in. And with the nice quote of ex nihilo nihil fit, you're describing by pure abstractions from a rational and ideal world, there is no real starting point for giving such policy uh, relevant or good guided um, mo modeling approaches that neoclassical economics is is derived from. So in your in your comment on what is left of Cambridge economics, you talk about a tragical end of um, the non-orthodox approaches in, in in Cambridge and the path that Coyle and others are sort of approaching towards exploring non-core orthodox path but actually exploring these uh, paths of economics but just deviating a little bit the original course but actually not embracing the intellectual heritage that is actually out there and with these thoughts i want to um, add a couple of um, content maybe contentious but hopefully discussion encouraging comments and questions that came through my mind when um, i was thinking about your your text and the speech um, so first of all, the potential of economics to change as well as its need to change. Um, in your in your comment um, on the on the book, you, um, and as you started your speech, I was curious to hear in, in what in which way you actually see economics discipline in the further future to change. So you had some outline about the the current state, but I'd be curious to hear kind of what are the following steps that you would project for economics to go. And here I'm especially interested, um, since you and Coyle share this policy uh, relevant idea in terms of economics, um, in how far we can use this context for the challenges and the current problems that we are facing to actually build better economics to um, come up with policies that help us address these changes. So could we use the big tasks that are ahead of us, like huge gap in income distribution, inequality and climate change and um, racial and gender struggles that we're all facing to actually build a better and a more progressive economics. And here as a little um, anecdote, I, I once heard, I think it was from Stieglitz, that for being part of the American Economic Association, you were, or as an economist, uh, you were required to take um, free trade as the ultimate benefit and minimum wages as something totally bad. So there was a very clear idea what which sort of policies do have an absolute benefit and which not. And actually with some newer studies and empirical research over time, um, while still in certain circles, these things are considered to be true and uh, good things, um, there was some cast up. Uh, there, there was some doubt cast about them. And here I think also very noteworthy, the Card and Kruger paper in the 1990s that really did a good job in exploring how minimum wages were actually not responsible for increasing unemployment, but actually had a, came, came with a social benefit for service workers. And I mean, there was also the Nobel Prize given in the part in the name of Card for this development. So yeah, and that can, in that case, I feel that research actually has been able to cast doubt and put some skepticism about some priorly held beliefs that the core econ discipline was holding. And with that thought in mind, I'm kind of also asking, what do you recommend for young scholars nowadays in terms of these challenges and new research methods that we have? Uh, what in, in how far could, uh, is, is there a way for us to build a better and more progressive economics and policy perspective? And lastly, I want to use a uh, drop also a little word in terms of the amount of um, possible uh, of, of data driven economics approaches that, that we're having nowadays, because it seems like that with actually having more and more information available to 
use in our research. There's also new avenues for, econom for economists to even publish in very highly ranked scientific journals like Nature and so on. So there are economists and I, for instance, I know one from Italy, D'Alessandro, and they published a paper in 2019 with a actually pretty Keynesian macro model, a Euro green model that they developed, which is post growth inspired and features some Keynesian demand functions. And I think such um, developments are an interesting observation for economists to look into okay, and how far did the economics discipline build its understanding based on prior models and beliefs and then how far can we actually use new developments and new data available to to go further down and um, change maybe what economics has been so far and yeah with these thoughts and comments I want to end my uh, end my discussion note and thank you very much for coming and your very thought-provoking presentation thank you so much thank you Andreas thank you very much uh, I can say uh, just a quick word I don't want to uh, uh, you know, take up too much more of time and let that might be used by other questions and so forth. But on the very crucial question of well, what is to be done, uh, Lenin's famous question, uh, uh, what is to be done? I think that uh, it's, it's very clear that it's now possible uh, to develop uh, alternative, um, coherent, uh, and systematic traditions. Uh, in ways which do not require moving up through the uh, obviously blocked channels uh, of the hierarchies of the economics profession. Uh, this is what we're doing right now with uh, you know, using uh, taking advantage of technological possibilities that weren't present uh, very, you know, even just a few years ago. Um, and uh, what uh, it, some journalists, in particular, point to the real world um, economics review. Uh, there are publication outlets, uh, again, that will not get you uh, uh, tenure in, an, in, a, in a mainstream department, uh, but that are nevertheless uh, widely circulated, readily accessible, widely read, and one has to take advantage of the opportunities that are there. Uh, as Coyle herself points out, the, 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 the uh, uh, advancing through the through the economics departments, and basically in most cases, requires you to publish in one of five journals, all of which are tightly controlled by a, a slightly, only slightly varying, uh, you know, tweedledee, tweedledum versions of the mainstream doctrines. But, so that it's a uh, that is a game which uh, only a very small number of people. Uh, can uh, succeed at, uh, while at the same time maintaining a modicum of uh, intellectual independence and integrity. Uh, so one has to do other things. Uh, and uh, uh, meanwhile, quietly and or not so quietly bring pressure on institutions which have the capacity to uh, maintain independent spaces or to create new ones in, in, in auxiliary departments. And I've been very fortunate, obviously, to have been in a public policy school rather than an economics department all these years uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to continue to do that and to provide a, a vehicles and for, um, for uh, the, the expression and development of diverse ideas while at the same time building a, uh, the kind of community that you know, I'm very pleased to see here, uh, you know, that this is, this is where uh, significant work is going to be done. It's not going to be done by converting existing mainstream economists to new ideas. Uh, they, have, they have a habit of, uh, of, of taking over certain words, Keynesian being one of the most notorious examples, but there were many um, new institutionalism and new this and new that. Uh, even new classical economics uh, and draining the this vampire semantics, uh, they, you know, they're draining them of their of their flesh and blood uh, in order to give them a meaning which uh, which then makes it very difficult for the next generation coming along to to try and uh, penetrate and understand what was what was originally there. Uh, so that's 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 the I have an inst that's my institutional answer. One has to keep building a community uh, in the face of the obstacles. Um, one of the things that 
that uh, I mean, and there are obviously some uh, some sources of financial support for doing that. I, 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 I've been certainly helped uh, by INET and some other entities over the top, Ford Foundation, from time to time. But also, you know, one of the main things to remember: is that important developments don't necessarily require a lot of money, uh, and the methodological uh, you know, um, emphasis on uh, micro foundations has an empirical counterpart in survey research, which is, which is costly uh, and brings people sort of basically into a, a, a structure which requires them to get financing from other people who have already vetted their, their methodologies. Uh, we bypassed all of that. You know, I don't say everybody could do what we did. We had particularly low hanging fruit in recognizing that there were vast amounts of, 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 of institutional data, organizational data regional data, industrial data, from which inequality measures, which, which we were interested in, could easily be extracted. This was not a problem. Uh, we just had to go and collect the tables and copy them into spreadsheets, or ultimately they were, became available online. You could simply download them uh, and then run a, run a very, very simple set of calculations. And all you had to do was be careful about how clean the data were, and you got very, very good numbers. So we were very lucky from that point of view. Um, and that meant that ultimately we had uh, the, one of the largest uh, uh, data sets that uh, uh, on inequality that uh, um, uh, that exists in the world. It's actually the largest uh, that has a, a single consistent concept of inequality. In our case, it's gross income and in, in household income inequality. Uh, and that is not based, uh, it does not involve interpolations or filling in the gaps between countries or over time by simply averaging across gaps. So every number that we publish is based upon data for that country and for that year. Uh, and, uh, and it's a simple set of routines to generate both a, a direct measure, which is a, a tile statistic and an indirect measure, which is a, an estimated household income Gini coefficient, which puts everything into the same language that everybody else uses uh, for this kind of data. Uh, but uh, that, that then means that you can, you can do things uh, looking at comparisons over time and across countries uh, that, you're, that are otherwise, very, otherwise obscured by enormous amounts of noise or enormous inadequacies in the data. Uh, and if you compare, uh, as we have done our work with other efforts along the same lines, which I don't want to disparage, I think working with tax data is, was a very good idea. The problem is tax records are not sufficiently rich and, and, and not sufficiently comparable across countries or through time. Uh, so you make a lot of mistakes if you, uh, uh, if you rely on that information. Uh, survey, survey records are, 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 there are many of them, but they are, they are very uh, conceptually inconsistent uh, and uh, problematic in a lot of ways. And they have enormous, enormous gaps. Uh, so you can then assess the advantages of a particular line of work. But as I said before, all of this is, requires, is, you know, basically forging ahead uh, with the opportunities you have and with the resources that are available, which don't necessarily have to be very large. And then you begin to make some progress. Thank you.